called um, ET. So plants can control transpiration by closing stomates, whereas evaporation occurs from the soil surface in the first few days after precipitation or irrigation. Uh, when the plant canopy has 100% cover, then there's little to no evaporation from the soil surface for two reasons. First, the sun does not reach the soil surface. And second, the plant canopy has high humidity. Although we found that this really didn't apply to Waiuli, um, and we were wondering why when we had a completely closed can plant canopy, did we still observe evaporation from the soil surface? And actually making this lecture, I just figured it out. It's because the, the Waiuli plant canopy is not that moist. And so that extra factor reducing evaporation from the soil surface isn't there. So there's um, actually evapor evaporation from the soil surface with um, Waiuli, even when the canopy cover is full. Um, OK, another. Uh, based on a mistake I made in my research, or not a mistake, yeah, it was this was a mistake. The last one wasn't really a mistake, just an observation. But um, water transfer to the vapor phase in plants is um, entirely due to solar radiation on the leaves. As you can imagine, there's not a lot of, you know, um, temperature buffer effect on leaves. They're very thin. So the solar radiation completely controls the evaporation from the leaf. And that's why the evaporation is high in the middle of the day and low at um, the ends of the day and none at night. Whereas in a pond, the sun does not directly control evaporation. Instead, it's the vapor pressure deficit between the water surface and the atmosphere. The sun's light goes into the pond and heats it up. And there's more evaporation if the pond is heated up than if the pond is cooler. So it, it depends on the, the vapor pressure deficit between the pond and the atmosphere. And with the soil surface, it's it's the same thing. It's the um, or the temperature gradient between the uh, pond and the soil surface or the soil surface. <laughs> Getting confused here. Pond in the atmosphere or the soil surface in the atmosphere. Um, so this diagram we can see that um, evapotranspiration is composed of two parts. There's transpiration from the leaves and then evaporation from the soil surface. So we, we combine it all as one term, which we normally call ET, call ET. Also, it's important to realize that the um, molecules are in an equilibrium at the water surface. So it's not just molecules moving in one direction. It's a, it's a function of what's the greater driving force. Is it the, you know, is it, would it be like at dew point, water condensing onto the water surface from the atmosphere? Or is it um, a dry atmosphere where water's being driven into the atmosphere, either by the vapor pressure deficit between the water surface and the atmosphere or the solar radiation uh, breaking the hydrogen bonds and allowing water to go from the liquid phase to the vapor phase. Okay, and we have a term in, in um, ET research called reference evapotranspiration, and it's actually used um, by farmers, by crop consultants to estimate the amount of water that they're gonna need for the crop. So in order to standardize ET measurements across crops and regions, scientists have set up a standard for measurement and calculation of evapotranspiration. So that's reference ET. And the advantage of having a standardized measurement is you can transfer it across crops and across regions. So um, it's defined as the rate of evapotranspiration millimeters per day from well-watered 10 centimeter tall turf grass, such as this, this grass right here, or 30 centimeters tall alfalfa that is free from disease, insect infestations, or other factors that may stress or limit its growth and transpiration rate. And also you never um, put the cover crop, or at least this is theory, you never put it under stress so that it, that would reduce or uh, water stress in the soil. 
which would reduce the rate of evapotranspiration. So that's why they place these uh, weather stations. I don't know if you've seen them. This is an azimuth weather station where we have like 30 stations in the state uh, distributed around you know, different regions like Phoenix, Yuma, Maricopa, even up in Prescott. And there used to be one in Flagstaff, but um, there was a funding shortage. And so they needed local areas to support their own weather stations. So they had to close some of them down. Okay, so let's get into the equation for um, calculation of evaporation. And this is not the reference ET equation or the um, equation that might be used for specific crops. This is a, a more of a fundamental equation. Uh, actually, it is the reference ET equation if you calibrate it to that. But this is more fundamental, whereas the other equations might have some standard coefficients. So um there's there's several parts to this equation and the one i'm i'm focusing on here is the conductance so that's this h sub v term and the conductance is the inverse of the resistance and the resistance is the bulk surface resistance to vapor transfer rs and the aerodynamic resistance to vapor transfer, RAV. So both of those determine the rate that essentially water is going from the soil to the atmosphere. And <clears throat> the total resistance would be the sum of the two. And then the conductance, which is what we use in this equation, would be the inverse of the resistance. And so you can see here that the conductance, the water vapor transfer conductance is one over the aerodynamic resistance plus the surface resistance. Okay, so let's talk about the aerodynamic resistance. Um, the aerodynamic res resistance to water vapor transfer for well water turf um, can be calculated as 208 over the... Um, the wind speed at two meters elevation. And so in this diagram, you can see that they're measuring the wind speed right here. And this is three meters elevation. So when you use azimuth weather stations, uh, sometimes you have to convert the three meter wind speed to the two meter wind speed. And um, that's done with a logarithmic equation because the, the wind speed follows a logarithmic uh, profile with elevation above the ground. And one thing I forgot to mention about the reference ET is that once you calculate the reference ET for um, grass, then you can transfer it to other crops with what's called the crop coefficient. So um, what scientists have done with lysimeters and other types of studies we did that with our Wayuli, is um, they've calculated the ratio between reference in ET and the crop for all times of the, the crop growing season. And they developed this crop coefficient curve. When the crop is fully mature, the crop coefficient is about one, meaning the crop ET is about the same as the reference ET, but like early in the season and late in the season when it's, when it's either um, immature or drying out, the crop coefficient might be closer to 0 0.2 or 0.5. Okay, so here's the bulk uh, surface resistance and it's the sum of the um, resistance to water movement through the soil and plant, the stomata, and then the movement within the canopy. So they add all of those up and um, you might wonder how soil moisture affects this calculation. Would, any, would anybody want to, to uh, think about that or discuss that? I've sort of given a clue earlier in this lecture. Hmm? Yes? Yes. 
that's very good. But why isn't it in this equation? I don't think so. I think it's more the root interface with the soil. I might be wrong, but I don't think so. Well, the reason it's not in the equation is we never allow reference um, surfaces to go below the threshold where we're reducing ET. So we keep the soil uh, fully irrigated. And so that's not part of the equation. Of course, it would be part of the equation. You know, for example, dry grass um, that you see um, or, you know, like Waiuli, we let the, the soil become extremely dry. So, yeah, it's not, so whenever you do uh, evapotranspiration research, it's specifically the crop coefficient, you always irrigate fully. You replace the um, moisture deficit fully up to field capacity, and you don't allow it to go below MAB. So by definition, the crop coefficient is calculated with um, fully irrigated conditions. Uh, the difficulty with that is like Waiuli, where we're finding that if we stress the crop and reduce the water use, we are improving the rubber production. But we have we just finished a paper um, on Waiuli ET and crop coefficient but we only did it for the 100% irrigated treatment, but we have many other treatments that we have to look at. So that'll be interesting to try to figure all those things out. Okay, so let's look at an example here. Um, calculate the total resistance to water vapor transfer and the water vapor transfer conductance for a well-watered turf crop. Wind speed at two meters elevation is three meters per second. Bulk surface resistance is 70 seconds per meter. Okay, notice it's inverse of meters per second. So resistance is seconds per meter, conductance is meters per second. Calculate the maximum rate of water vapor transfer due to the vapor pressure gradient if the relative humidity is 30%, temperature is 30 degrees centigrade, and the elevation is sea level, and um, use the following resistances for turf. So um, our bulk surface resistance is 70 seconds per meter. Our aerodynamic resistance is 208 over the wind speed at two meters, or 69 seconds per meter. So the total resistance to water vapor transfer through the um, grass canopy, if you want to call it that, is 70 plus 69 or 139 seconds per meter. So the conductance would be 1 over the R total or 1 over 139 or 0.0072 meters per second. Okay, now we're going to calculate the maximum rate of water vapor transfer due to the vapor pressure gradient if the real, oh, I already mentioned all those things, but now we're gonna focus on the second part of the problem. So here's the equation we're gonna use and all we need to do is fill in the terms. Okay, so the canopy vapor pressure is the um, saturation vapor pressure. Why do you think that is? Why do we assume that? Well, it's not the soil. We're looking at the canopy. And really, we're looking at the top of the canopy because um, that's what is in contact with the atmosphere.
Yes, that's a good um, question. So the saturation vapor pressure is the amount of water that the air will hold at a relative humidity of 100%. So the, the air will hold a certain amount of water. And let me ask you a few questions um, related to this that'll help you think about uh, this concept. Um, when air goes over mountains, it rains, right? Why is that? The what? The, that's right. The relative humidity does reach one. Yes, that's that's very good. One hundred percent. But why does it reach that when it goes over the mountains? Okay, so Lali said it's the pressure. And the pressure might have something to do with it, but that's not the main thing. Yes? Yeah, the temperature. So air will hold less water at a colder temperature. Okay. Uh, when does dew fall on the ground? In the morning. Okay. And why is that? Same reason, because the air gets cold. Right. And um, let's say we had air at 30 degrees centigrade. I'm just trying to give some typical uh, values for Arizona. So at 40 degrees centigrade, the relative humidity is 15%. At 20 degrees centigrade, you know, these are day-night fluctuations. The um, relative humidity might be 80%. Is there any more water in the air? Yes, Michael? Yes, that's right. So the, the amount of water in the air doesn't change. It's the relative humidity, which is the amount of water in the air over the amount of water the air could hold, okay? So I think, uh, does anybody know how much water air will hold, what percent at like 40 degrees centigrade? Yes, it is a function of temperature and pressure. Um, but I think the temperature is much more important. Hmm? Oh, a closed, at, like a, in a vessel. Right, that would be different. Like steam calculations, those kind of things. Right. So... Um, we do have pressure in this equation, actually. Um, here's pressure right down here, um, air pressure. But um, for example, when we calculate the saturated vapor pressure, we only use this equation, which doesn't include pressure. Am I wrong here? Why doesn't this equation include pressure if it's mean if it matters, if pressure does matter, like we just pointed out the, the steam vessel? Yeah. This is um this is an empirical equation, just a regression equation that somebody came up with. And so it's it doesn't include pressure because that wasn't a very significant factor for this calculation. Maybe this is at sea level, I can't remember. It's been a while since I looked at this equation. Okay, anyway, um, the saturated vapor pressure is 17.27 um, times the temperature in Celsius over the temperature in Celsius plus 237 or Kelvin degrees. Okay, so that's the, um, the saturated vapor pressure. 
at 30 degrees centigrade is 4.24 K Pascals. So that's the partial pressure of water in the atmosphere. Okay. And then the atmospheric vapor pressure is the product of saturation vapor pressure and relative humidity. So it would be um, the saturation vapor pressure that we calculated up here times the relative humidity over 100%. So it's just 4.24 times 0.3 or 30% over 100% equals 1.27 K Pascals. So now we have these two parts of our equation and we have the aero, the conductance to water vapor tra uh, transfer. Okay, and now we do have pressure in the equation. So here's the pressure and it's a function of um, elevation above sea level. But the problem states that the um, location is sea level or the elevation is sea level. So the pressure is 101.3 K Pascals. Okay, and then I had a little mistake in this equation, so I blocked it out. But now we have all the terms that we need. Um, the air density at sea level is 1.23 kilograms per meters cube. Our, our um, conductivity of water vapor pressure transfer is 0 0.0072 meters per second. <clears throat> our canopy vapor pressure is saturated vapor pressure or 4.24. This is our atmos bulk atmospheric vapor pressure. And our pressure is 101.3 K Pascals. So if we plug all those numbers in, we get, and we use the same units, we get 0 0.00016 kilograms over meter squared seconds, which is the same as 0 0.00016 millimeters per second, or uh, 0.58 millimeters per hour. And so generally, um, ET is calculated in two ways. It's calculated on an hourly basis or a daily basis. And so this is an hourly calculation. Yes? So would you use a similar equation? Like, what if you wanted to measure the just the evaporation from the surface of the pond? Or maybe the evapotranspiration because you have more vegetation on the surface and stuff. Would you use a different equation or just use some similar equation? Yeah, actually, I did a lot of research on that topic about 10 years ago, and we wrote some papers on pond evaporation. Oh, cool. And I had this big argument with a plant scientist, of course. I always argued. I never seemed to get along with plant scientists. <laughs> but <laughs> anyway, he was telling me, no, there's evaporation at night. We were doing algae ponds. Uh, we were doing the energy balance for algae ponds. And he just kept telling me um, there's evapor evaporation from ponds at night. And I had been doing ET research with plants and I knew there was no evaporation from plants. Yeah. So we had this argument for like a year and <laughs> it turned out he was right. And the reason he knew is he had a swimming pool. <laughs> And he knew that it lost water at night. So, and then um, the reason I found out, and finally uh, I was, he was right, even that he wasn't very happy about it. He knew what an idiot I, I had been. But anyway, um, I mean, he wasn't even happy when I admitted he was right, because it had been such a long argument. <laughs> But the reason I found out was I was modeling the pond temperature and it might agree with some periods, but it just wasn't agreeing with other periods. There was something wrong with my computer model. And the reason was I was modeling, modeling it like a plant. And then we had some partners uh, from Department of Energy who had the right model. And so I had to adjust my model to pond evaporation. And so um, pond evaporation is primarily, uh, like I said before, the sunlight goes into the pond. It doesn't directly cause molecules to break at the water surface. 
So it heats up the pond and the heated up pond will evaporate more water, but it's not a direct function of solar radiation. And that's why from ponds, you get like 30 or 40% of their total evaporation at night. You um, only get, but with ET from plants, you get about 100% in the daytime. And so you can imagine that they're completely, completely different models if you have 40% at night with one and 0% at night with the other. So once you get it right, um, then it really fits the model well. There's other factors too. Uh, one factor is the size of the pond. Like if you have a very small pond, there's not going to be any vapor vapor building up over the pond. You sort of develop a boundary layer over the lake, you know, downstream, downwind on the lake. You have a lot of vapor in the air that came off the up the upwind part of the lake. So that'll decrease your evaporation from the pond. And um, yeah, actually. I could um, find these papers. So that's a factor is boundary layer. Yeah. So um, here's the energy balance in the pond, solar radiation, latent heat of vaporization, um, net long wave radiation. So you have long wave radiation from the pond too. That's very important. Where you, is you don't have much of that from plants. You know, just it's a black body and it just releases heat to the atmosphere. And then you have sensible heat flux, which is the movement of energy from the water surface up into the atmosphere by convection and you have a soil heat transfer down into the soil by conduction. So your, you know, your pond's in contact with your soil. So um, yeah, all, all sorts of interesting equations here. You have albedo, the reflectance of the sun from the pond. Um, you have the black body equation, the Stefan Boltzmann equation, um, air emissivity, like how much the air is transferring energy to the pond. You have the wind function. So that's just like we had the U2, the 280, 208 over U2, we have a wind function like what is the wind is more turbulent when it's um, high, the air is more turbulent when there's a high wind. So that is, see, you shouldn't have gotten me on this topic here. So it's the same with the plants. The higher wind leads to more heat transfer because the turbulence is going to carry away heat. So um, here's the relationship between water temperature and latent heat of vaporization. And then we had this, there's this really cool equation, which is also used in ag research called the Bowen ratio, which is the ratio between vapor pressure transfer and heat transfer. And it's a really cool equation. Um, it It's like a linear function. So you can use that uh, very, uh, it's very important for trying to get the total energy transfer and water transfer and so on. Anyway, that was our experiment. Here's our little um, pond. And then here's our energy our temperature change. And you can see how closely we're simulating the measured temperature and the simulated temperature. And we had like different models for that. Um, some point in your career, 
a lot of you are going to have to measure, have somebody's going to ask you about their pond temperature or their pond evaporation. And so they're actually, this is a good um, model for that. Um, there's been, there were several studies. There was one study back in the 30s, one in the 60s. You know, the 30s was a small pond. The 60s was lakes. Uh, it's important for things like um, power plants where they have cooling water, things like that. Okay, so that was that. All right, so this this equation is specifically for plants. You know, this is not a pond equation. Okay, and sensible heat flux is the transfer of heat to the atmosphere. And instead of vapor pressure gradient, what do you think the gradient is that we're concerned about with heat flux, sensible heat flux? Yes. Yeah, it's the temperature gradient. Yeah. And like I said, that Bowen ratio is like the temperature gradient and the water gradient over each other. And it really is cool how it works. Okay. So we have temperature of the canopy minus temperature of the atmosphere. We have a conductance term. We have the heat capacity of the air and we have density of the air where that's needed because we're we have heat capacity in terms of kilograms. Okay, so this is the sensible heat flux equation, which we aren't going to use very much, but um, because we have, we're going to use an equation that kind of puts everything together. It's a very complicated equation, been validated by many. You know, it was, it was started by a leading physicist. And then it's been calibrated over and over with many, many experiments and evaluations. It's very mathematical. This is a very mathematical topic, just like soil. Soils are very mathematical. Okay, so um, One of the important factors is the is the wind speed profile over the canopy. And this is the wind speed profile over bare soil. And then with a canopy, uh, you you as you can imagine, you don't have much wind blowing through there. Um, so you can start your logarithmic equation up in the upper part of the canopy. And um, yeah, I'm kind of forgetting what this is. I think this is called the roughness height. I'm sorry about that. Um, which curve do you think applies to turf? The, at the weather station. Yeah, because basically bare soil, you just have a little bit of grass. So that's why if you had a three meter height wind gauge, the, there'd be a direct relationship between wind speed at three meters and wind speed at two meters height. Um, I mean, it would be affected by things like this, where um, you have a stable atmosphere, an unstable atmosphere, and a neutral atmosphere. So the unstable wind speed profile is here. And then here's the stable wind speed profile. So knowing you guys had fluid mechanics and flowing pipes, right? Okay. So knowing what you know about turbulence and flowing pipes, can you explain these curves? And can you also tell me what an unstable atmosphere and a stable atmosphere would be. Yes, Michael? Uh, the stable atmosphere would probably be 
Okay. Okay, so we have Eddie's heading pretty much across. Yeah. And what causes turbulent atmosphere like that? Yeah, gradients and temperature. So what would the temperature gradient be for unstable atmosphere? Yeah, but what's the direction? Okay, but how about with vertical, vertical profile? Hmm? The temperature would be less towards the surface with unstable atmosphere. Think about what causes air density. That's a good point. So the deeper you are, like in a water body, the yeah. the dent the higher pressure. Yeah. But when you think about this profile, where we're maybe zero to ten meters, yeah. is there going to be a big change in density due to all the atmosphere above it? No. So that's not going to cause the change in density. Is the is the height? Air does flow from. I'm not really sure about that. Oh, so that's... It flows from high to low density. Yeah. Or high pressure to low pressure. Low pressure would be colder, I guess. Wind goes from high to low pressure. Yes. Hmm? Um, I think high pressure is warmer. High pressure. Think about heating up something. It, it increases in pressure. Like if you heat up a vessel, you're increasing the pressure. But I might be wrong about the air. I haven't, but I know this answer, the vertical gradient. Um, no, it wouldn't be the humidity, although you would have more rapid transfer from the crop to the air with an unstable atmosphere because you'd have vertical eddies. Oh, go ahead and discuss in your groups if you want. Why don't I give you guys a few minutes to discuss in your groups? I'll pause the video. So what is, what is causing an unstable eddy or unstable atmosphere and unstable wind speed profile all the all those things kind of go together oh hot to cold hot at the bottom cold at the top yeah so would, would hot air be denser or lighter than cold air Lighter, lighter right so it would move up and that wouldn't cause mixing okay and then i heard michael mention what an inversion is it's when typically farther towards the ground the air is warmer because the gravity is not as soft and that hot air is formed at the ground and flows up too. with the inversion there is a layer higher up that is warmer than the air below it, preventing the air lower from moving farther up and just getting hotter. Okay, that sounds sounds good to me. Yeah. So okay. So we have this unstable eddy here. Why is it causing this type of profile? Think about pipe flow and turbulence and laminar flow. 
why does the unstable eddy cause this wind speed profile whereas the stable eddy and the stable atmosphere meaning it's colder at the bottom and warmer at the top has has this wind speed profile so the x axis the, the x axis is the speed right so it has I don't think this this slide is not so much wind speed a slide. I mean, there is wind speed in it, but we're more concerned with the eddies. Which one are we talking about? We're, we're talking about why that you have this curve with unstable and this curve with stable. I mean, it makes sense for stable because you still have friction. So it's sheer. It's going to continue fairly uniform. Yes, that's right. Just like a pipe with laminar flow, you have a, more of a gradient of velocities. And with turbulent flow, what do you have in a pipe? No gradient, and you just have a, you have the high speed close to the surface. So that's so the eddies are bringing the velocity up, or transferring the velocity up here down here, and so it has more of a vertical uh, wind speed profile. Okay. So um, this, actually, we had a guy here, Dr. Slack. Do you, any of you know him? Oh. He retired. He was like Mr. B.E. for 30 years. <laughs> but and he was our department head for like 20 years. But he did a lot of research on this. And um, I think this was one of his friends who made this, one of his students or something who made this graph. But this is the aerodynamic resistance at different atmospheric stabilities. So T surface minus TA is negative two. Does that mean this, I, I haven't looked at this in a while. Does that mean this is stable or unstable? TS minus TA. TA is up high, TS is down low, and it's negative two. Does that mean it's warmer above or warmer be uh, below? Lower. Your surface, yeah, lower. The higher you are, the warmer it is. Okay. Temperature in the surface minus temperature of the atmosphere, right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that would mean that the temperature of the atmosphere must be greater than the surface. Oh, okay. You get a negative number. So this is the resistance to energy transfer or water transfer with an inversion, basically, right? So it's a stable atmosphere. So this is a stable atmosphere and we have high resistance, right? Makes sense. We don't have the vertical eddies, we have the horizontal eddies, maybe no eddies. So, and, and you can see though, that once the wind speed gets up to three meters per second, the resistance is the same. There's low resistance once you have high wind speed, which makes sense. You know, you've got turbulence being propagated in the flow just due to wind speed. Instead of down in here in this range, the turbulence is propagated due to the um, the atmospheric mixing. Okay, and I uh, just one more thing I'll say is our world would be uninhabitable if not for atmospheric mixing. The surface of the Earth would heat up horribly if if not for atmospheric mixing. It's extremely important to the habitability of the Earth. The, the surface of the earth heats up because of the sun. The sun hits the ground surface, heats it up. And if it wasn't for atmospheric mixing, we would fry in the middle of the day. It, it I, I can't remember the exact numbers, but it's a, like a 30 degree temperature 
30 C temperature difference. Hmm? Yeah, although in the daytime it would get up to 70 C instead of 40 C. Although it's it's getting hotter all the time, yeah. Okay, so that was the vapor pressure or heat transfer uh, due to atmosphere. And remember, um, Ron, the so Ron, the atmospheric scientist, told us there was two effects: two effects, radiation and uh, energy transfer in the atmosphere. So now we're going to move on to radiation. And so the radiation is the solar radiation times one minus the albedo, and the albedo for grass is 0.23. So if the albedo for grass is 0.23, um, does that mean it's reflecting most of the solar radiation or just 23% of it? Yeah, so, um, well, first I'm asking you what albedo is. Is albedo, albedo is the amount of reflectance. Yeah, it means it's reflecting 23%. So the amount going into the grass is one minus the albedo times the solar radiation. And then the amount being emitted from the grass, and what would that be? Is that short wave radiation or long wave radiation? Long wave radiation is the black body radiation basically like that, although grass is not black. But um, anyway, so this would be the net radiation over the turf. Okay. <laughs> now, for some reason, Atmospheric scientists really like this unit of Langley's. It's the worst unit ever. We even report our radiation at our azimuth weather station as Langley's. Okay. Well, yeah, that's what it says. Calories per Okay, I guess it's not that bad. Calories per centimeter squared. It's just a really irritating unit when you're trying to use joules and meters squared and you have Langley's. So that's not really in the context of human nutrition, it's just energy? Well, calories in human nutrition is multiplied by a thousand. I just don't see how you calculate. It's kcals. Yeah, but it's the same calories. I mean, but the same. I it's, just, it's just a general energy. Yeah. Unit. Mm -hmm. So if we want to convert to joules, we have to do 43.1 calories per centimeter squared per hour times 4.18 joules per calorie or uh, 1.8 times 10 to the second joules per centimeter squared per hour or this or that. So it'd be 1.8 megajoules per meter squared per hour. Okay. And then um, we can calculate the total, total solar radiation um, intensity as 1.8 times 10 to the 6 joules per meter squared over 3,600 seconds because it's hours, calories per centimeter squared per hour. So that's 3,600 seconds or 500 watts per meter squared. That's the units we really like to use, watts per meter squared. Okay, and then calculate the net radiation intensity over turf, where turf albedo equals 0 0.83 or 0 0.23. Um, so we have 500 watts per meter squared coming from the sun, but the net radiation is 300 watts per meter squared. Okay, so that's what's available for evaporation. That's why this is important because the sun evaporates the water. And now there's a new 
um, website called Open ET where they are um, using six different models to calculate the net radiation over crops in the whole Western United States. If you type Open ET, you'll you'll see it, and it's really cool. But they're using the energy balance to try to calculate the water uh, evaporation from from farmland, so that farmers can use that for managing their water. So that's that's something we're getting involved with, actually, with our program. I told my programmer Reed the next thing to do is to automatically download Open ET data for our field. So that's next on our agenda. Okay, so um, let's talk about latent heat of, of vaporization and net radiation. Um, I've already talked about this, but um, the latent heat of a va vaporization and net radiation generally dominate the energy balance equation. So, you know, I, I showed you all those energy balance terms, soil heat transfer, uh, sensible heat transfer. Um, there was one or two others. Well, really, for crops, you can almost calculate the water loss based on the net radiation, which is the basis for open ET, because it it's very it's it's a very large part of the energy balance equation. Okay, so for a sunny day in an arid climate where water vapor transfer is not lift limiting. Okay, so remember I said it was the least, um, it, was, it was the term that was the least that controlled the evaporation. Remember there was, um, so it's, it's, and what they do is they incorporate that principle into their evapotranspiration equation, um, into their single evapotranspiration equation. But anyway, a reasonable approximation of ETO in an arid climate where we don't have any resistance to vapor transfer can be uh, made by equating the latent heat of vaporization to net radiation. So over a one meter squared area, one millimeter depth of water is equal to one kilogram. So in this case, ETO in millimeters is equal to the net radiation kilojoules per meter squared over the latent heat of vaporization. So that's nice. So anyway, um, this is just showing the unit conversion where a one millimeter times one meter squared is one kilogram. And then the ETO is the net radiation over the latent heat of vaporization in millimeters. So that's a nice relationship. So uh, Calculate the depth of water transpired from turf in one hour if all net solar radiation is converted to the latent heat of vaporization. Um, cumulative radiation energy over one hour is 43.1 Langley's. Temperature is 30 degrees centigrade. Uh, so as calculated in example 5.2, net radiation is 300 watts per meter squared, which if we use the unit conversion, is 1,080 kilojoules per meter squared per hour. And we calculate the latent heat of vaporization based on the temperature. So it has a temperature relationship. So it's 2,431 kilojoules per kilogram. So ETO is the um, net radiation over lambda or 1,080 kilojoules per meter squared over 2,431 kilojoules per millimeter meter squared or kilogram or 0.44 millimeters per hour. Okay, any questions? At least nobody fell asleep. <laughs> 